Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our weekly discussion on weed science and research. This week we'll be addressing herbicide resistance with alternative chemistries. We'll get started here in probably about 45 seconds. Again, thanks everyone for joining us. I'd like to introduce Dr. Stanley Culpepper, WSSA president to kick things off for us today. Dr. Culpepper. Thank you so much, Eric. And thank you everybody for joining the We Science Society of America and USDA ARS as we offer the seventh webinar in this unique series. My name is Stanley Culpepper and I'm the current president of the We Science Society of America. For those of you not familiar with how this webinar series came to be, Dr. Steve Duke and Steve Young submitted a symposium request to the WSSA board to be shared at our annual meeting this past February. It of course received full support for our board. When the annual meeting unfortunately had to move to a virtual format, we decided to offer those approved and supported symposiums throughout the year through our webinar series. Today again is our seventh with USDA ARS. So now it is my privilege to welcome you and to introduce Dr. Steve Young as your mod moderator. Steve is a weed scientist and the national program leader for weeds and invasive pests at ARS. Steve. Thanks Stanley, appreciate that introduction. And again, I appreciate the support from WSSA to host this webinar series. Um, and as you mentioned, this is number seven. We've been making our way through several different topics, uh, several different themes. And today we're gonna wrap up with the theme of mechanisms and we're gonna hear about herbicide resistance. So I wanna introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Scott Bayerson. He's got 32 years of research experience and is widely recognized in the allelopathy and pest resistance fields. Uh, he has pioneered the use of genomics-based approaches for studying plant root hair cells. And along with his ARS colleagues, elucidated the full genetic and biochemical components of a novel allele chemical biosynthetic pathway representing a major contribution to our understanding of plant secondary metabolism. He is currently leading the efforts to deploy this pathway for the development of transgenic crops more resistant to weed infestations. Dr. Bayerson also made significant contributions to the Roundup Ready brand as an industrial scientist at Monsanto through his work in the gene expression, weed resistance, and specialty crops biotechnology fields. During the course of his career, Dr. Bayerson has also been awarded 11 patents, has had his work appear in numerous prestigious journals, including Plant Cell, Plant Physiology, New Phytologist, and PANS, and was a recipient of the prestigious Grudzinski Award from the International Allelopathy Society. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Scott, but first I'm gonna remind folks, this is supposed to be a discussion, supposed to be an um, engaging uh, event. So please use the chat box or the Q&A box to uh, put your questions and we'll get to as many as we can uh, after Scott's finished with his presentation. So Scott, go ahead and take it away. Okay. All right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm very grateful to uh, WSSA and the USDA for giving me a chance to talk to you this afternoon about what. Uh, uh, my colleagues and myself are doing uh, in addressing herbicide resistance uh, with alternative chemistries in the Agricultural Research Service. So um, clearly there's an urgent need for new modes of action uh, for weed control, uh, given that herbicide resistance is, is evolving rapidly and spreading quite quickly. And in fact, now 23 out of the 26 known herbicide uh, modes of action have resistant biotypes against them. Um, and a big reason is the over-reliance in the past couple of decades uh, that uh, agriculture has had on chemical weed control, and uh, the herbicide-resistant crops has only made this problem a lot worse. And uh, the 
conditions that are cited most frequently as being the culprit in driving herbicide resistance is frequent applications of a single mode of action that unfortunately occurs all too often and is the leading cause of herbicide resistance. So um, herbicide resistance uh, is actually a relatively new phenomenon compared to resistance to uh, other pest control agents such as insecticides and fungicides, which uh, resistance to them increased dramatically after 1950. And despite the fact that uh, a lot of modes of action were beginning to be introduced uh, in the late 30s, we really didn't see a big uptick in cases of herbicide resistance until uh, after 1975. And, uh, and it went on quite a trajectory at that point, as you can tell, uh, so that as of today, there's 512 unique uh, instances of uh, herbicide resistance reported worldwide. And this is approximately equally split between dicot and monocot weeds. Um, some modes of action are more prone to herbicide resistance uh, than others, uh, so, and I'll go through a little bit of that later in my talk. But uh, the first cases that, as mentioned, occurred in the mid-70s were uh, primarily the photosystem II uh, in targeting herbicides, uh, such as the triazines, and they were widely used in corn uh, at that time. So that <clears throat> propelled the uptick in resistance of that uh, to the PS2 herbicides. And then later, during the uh, mid-80s, uh, ALS inhibit, inhibiting herbicides resistance to, to uh, that target really took off, uh, which includes uh, widely used herbicides such as sulfonylureas and imidazolinones. And uh, actually, by the year 2000, this became the most, uh, the, the most resistance prone mode of action for uh, reasons that I'll go into uh, a little bit later. Um, and then finally, after uh, more than 20 years of extensive use worldwide. Uh, they thought it was an invulnerable target, but sure enough, uh, glyphosate resistant uh, biotype uh, was identified in Australia. I actually had the chance to work, with, work on that. Um, and uh, then it uh, really took off glyphosate resistant biotypes at that time, although most of the cases of glyphosate resistance are associated with the cultivation of glyphosate resistant crops. <clears throat> so um, I mentioned that certain targets are uh, prone to resistance and ALS uh, acetolactate synthase, which is an enzyme involved in branch chain amino acid biosynthesis, uh, is actually the most resistance prone target. Um, and uh, just to illustrate, so to the left, this is a screen uh, that was done uh, at Monsanto a number of years ago where they were comparing, they're using mutagenized Arabidopsis to look at the frequency of mutants. Um, and uh, ALS, after one round uh, saturate, uh, saturation screen, five different uh, mutants, which uh, if memory serves correctly, represented distinct mutations, all against uh, ALS were recovered and uh, for comparison, glyphosate didn't yield any mutants. And uh, it turns out that uh, the target enzyme, um, there, there's over 20 uh, amino acid substitutions that have been identified that create uh, herbicide resistant ALS variant. Um, and at uh, the PRO197 position, there's 12 different amino acid substitutions identified uh, alone, just at that position. So this is the most resistance prone target. And uh, the, an important point is that these resistant variants are actually catalytically efficient. So consequently, there's very little to no fitness cost for the host that harbors these variants. So this is uh, one of the major reasons why ALS is so resistant prone because the, the target enzyme has the ability to com accommodate uh, various mutations that that inhibit herbicide binding while still maintaining full catalytic activity and no fitness cost to the plant. Um, and then there's also uh, species that are particularly resistance prone. For example, plants belonging to the genuses Lolium, Amaranthus, Caniza, Echinocloa uh, represent the most herbicide uh, resistance prone weeds. And in particular, Lolium rigidum or rigid ryegrass uh, is the most uh, resistance prone species known 
and has actually acquired resistance to 11 different herbicide modes of action in biotypes from 12 different countries. And uh, perhaps not surprisingly, was also the first species to uh, acquire resistance to glyphosate. And that was actually the case that occurred in 1996 in Australia. Um, so why plants are prone to resistance isn't very well understood. Um, there was an interesting study recently published by Holman Liu that correlated uh, wide ge geographic distribution, uh, obligate outcrossing, incomplete flowers, in other words, uh, separate male and female flowers on the same plant, wind pollination and complex polyploid genomes, as well as large seed size are correlated with a tendency to uh, develop resistance. But of course, there's much we don't know uh, at the biochemical level, at the genetic level. There's certainly other factors that predispose certain species towards acquiring resistance. And uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, there's, there's quite a few holes in our understanding that need to be filled. So um, I just wanna give a couple examples that underscore that uh, resistance is a complex problem and it's getting more complicated all the time. So uh, to illustrate that, um, there's here's an example of two uh, Italian ryegrass populations were identified in California, and uh, both populations were uh, highly resistant to glyphosate, cethoxidim, and paraquat. Both populations, high levels of resistance, and so the point being that uh, cross this uh, is referred to as cross resistance. This is unfortunately a uh, very common place, and which also points out the fact that addressing uh, weed resistance problems is no longer a simple question of switching modes of action uh, to a different mode of action for farmers because a lot of these um, biotypes have cross resistance. So uh, the complexity of the problem is ever increasing. And then uh, another scenario that is uh, not, unfortunately not uncommon, um, here's a case of a tall water hemp population uh, that was identified in Mississippi. This population does have a resistant EPS uh, P enzyme, which does confer some level of resistance. But in addition, this population is associated with uh, reduced uptake of glyphosate. And also once it is taken up, its movement in the plant is severely reduced. So this is a type of so-called non-target based resistance that doesn't involve the target enzyme EPSP synthase, as well as a resistant EPSP synthase target based resistance occurring in the same plant in, in the same population. Um, so, and uh, this these nice characterizations of these uh, different populations was done by uh, ARS scientist uh, BJ Nandula, who's actually now one of our national program leaders in the crop protection and uh, pest management program. So uh, another interesting case, I want to, uh, I mentioned that the uh, amaranthus genus is one of the more resistant uh, prone group of plants. And uh, one member in particular is becoming a major problem for US growers, Palmer amaranth, which is a pigweed. And it's currently one of the most uh, problematic and economically significant weed species that affects all of our major crops, including corn, cotton, and soybean, and is a real nightmare for uh, US growers. And biotypes have been identified in the United States with resistance to ALS inhibitors, dinitroanilines, glyphosate, HPPD inhibitors, and triazine herbicides. So uh, this, we this weed has just created uh, almost insurmountable problems for uh, growers in the States. And uh, the most frightening uh, and fascinating thing about this weed is it's come up with a, a completely uh, new mechanism, or at least the first time we've seen this sort of thing occur in a resistant weed. Um, and this involves extra, chromo extra chromosomal circular DNAs, ECC DNAs that were discovered in Palmer amaranth. And what these are, are extra chromosomal uh, DNA elements that can uh, autonomously replicate and they insert into various uh, loci all across the uh, uh, Palmer amaranth genome and uh, then increase copy number in that manner. And uh, this is not the first discovery of ECC DNAs. They're actually thought to 
occur in all uh, organisms, um, their, their actual, their normal role isn't fully understood, but they're also associated with human cancers uh, and they can actually, actually promote tumor growth because they encode functional oncogene. So they can increase the copy number of the oncogene um, in tumor cells. And um, so in uh, the highly resistant Palmer uh, amaranth biotypes, there could be uh, from 40 to 100 fold increase in the uh, copy number of EPSPS. And even though that's a sensitive enzyme, when you increase uh, the number of copies 40 to 100 fold, even if uh, the herbicide exposure is reducing the activity 95%, you've got 100 copies. So you're still at normal pathway flux. So uh, this mechanism enables them to withstand uh, normal herbicide dosages. And I also want to point out uh, this a lot of this work was done by. Uh, Bill Molin, who's a plant physiologist with the USDA, the uh, Crop Production Systems Research Unit in Stoneville. And uh, he, I believe he's the first author on a recent uh, plant cell paper describing this work. And um, I uh, encourage you to check it out. Okay, so um, as if there weren't another, enough uh, factors that were uh, working against us in in terms of herbicide resistant weeds, we also have to factor in climate change. And it turns out climate change can also have a catastrophic effect on the efficacy of some of our herbicides. So for example, uh, pre-emergent uh, herbicides are widely used in the United States in corn production, but pre-emergent herbicides require a period of rainfall after they're applied, otherwise they're not effective. And climate change will be associated with less predictable rainfall. Um, that is uh, one of the um, what the models predict for how it will impact certain growing areas. So uh, one of our research ecologists in the USDA, uh, Marty Williams, who works at the Global Change and Photosynthesis Research Unit in Urbana, uh, his lab performed some logistic regression models with these pre-emergent herbicides against foxtail, lamb, quarter, and water hemp and found that uh, variable rainfall was a major driver in the uh, loss of efficacy of these um, herbicides associated with climate change. So, and the reason why I bring this up uh, in the context of this talk, um, not only obviously is this uh, uh, very concerning, uh, but when you have um, sub, uh, suboptimal efficacy, you are exposing weeds to uh, potentially sublethal doses of nervicide, which are the exact conditions that promote the emergence of uh, herbicide resistance. So uh, climate change could be another factor uh, propelling the, um, driving the evolution of herbicide resistance in weeds and reducing the efficacy of our chemical tools. <clears throat> so with uh, all these dire warnings about uh, the current state of our mode of action, one would think that uh, there's great impetus for and great drive in industry for the development of new herbicides. But unfortunately, the opposite is actually occurring. Um, there have been no new major modes of action introduced in more than 30 years. As a matter of fact, most of the herbicide modes of action that we work with today were introduced between 1930 and 1985, a period where a new mode of action was produced approximately every two years. And as you can see, a, a very different case exists today. And uh, what is widely cited as the reason for that is uh, the exorbitant costs of bringing new herbicides to market, as well as the unpredictable regulatory environment that companies face after introducing their products. So. Um, they're very reluctant to invest in this area right now. And uh, that could have dire consequences for world agriculture. Because if you think about it, uh, the impact that a lack of available effective herbicides could have on the global economy, as well as world food security, which of course always uh, affects the most vulnerable populations the most severely. This problem is every bit as uh, significant for mankind as uh, the loss of antibiotic efficacy, uh, efficacy due to uh, um, antibiotic resistant um, microorganisms. <clears throat> so uh, what is the ARS doing about it? And I'll go through that uh, the rest of my talk. So um, the first thing I'd like to discuss is a team 
um, that is in Oxford, Mississippi, the Natural Products Utilization Research Unit. It's an interdisciplinary team comprised of uh, Dr. Ji Xiong Pan, a molecular biologist, Joanna Basha Herschel, a plant physiologist, Charles Cantrell, and Kumadini Nidgala, research chemist. And uh, they are using various strategies to look for novel modes of action, including um, looking at uh, uh, determining the mode of action for novel structures that have herbicidal activity and, and likely to target uh, novel cellular functions. Um, also looking at uh, pharmaceuticals that aren't no, that may have herbicidal activity and, and could also make uh, efficacious herbicides. Um, and then of course, the um, designing uh, novel synthetics, um, using uh, uh, modeling of targets, um, and then uh, a lot of effort, perhaps uh, as more effort than in the other areas, given the location of, of this research unit, is looking at naturally occurring uh, phytotoxins. That is dipping into nature's chemical toolbox for the thousands of different uh, 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 active herbicidal compounds with herbicidal activity that target novel uh, functions in the cell. And uh, just um, some of the advantages of working on uh, natural products versus synthetics include um, they often possess um, more complex modes of action. They may not have a singular, uh, single primary target. They could have multiple cellular targets and, and hence are, are less prone to, uh, for uh, resistance to uh, develop against them. Also, um, they've, they've, evolved in a sense that, that nature has refined these chemicals over thousands of years to function optimally in, in their natural settings. So they may, they may require less optimization than a synthetic chemical. Um, of course, it's a natural product, so there'll be increased public acceptance and consequently potentially fewer regulatory hurdles um, to uh, overcome when bringing them to market. Um, and then a real key difference, um, when you have a natural product, that means that there is a gene and there's an enzyme that was involved in its biosynthesis. And you can also isolate those. And so you're not limited when you're working with a natural product to, to uh, chemical synthesis. You, uh, by uh, identifying the genes, then um, the, the compounds amenable to, for example, scale up fermentation. And you can also consider uh, implanter production, which uh, I'll discuss that approach um, later in my talk. Also, natural products tend to have uh, shorter environmental half-lives and so are, are generally more uh, environmentally friendly. And uh, uh, sort of a, a newer realization, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, is that particularly when um, these uh, natural products originate from microorganisms, um, a lot of times the biosynthetic enzymes are, are clustered um, all next to each other in the chromosome. And they may, may also be co-clustered with a resistance gene. I'll show an example of that. So, uh, and that certainly would never be the case with uh, when you're working with a synthetic. Um, uh, and I want to point out an interesting uh, review article, opinion piece that was written by Gerwitz and Sparks a few years ago, where they're talking about um, the actual impact that natural products have had on the crop protection market. So. Um, their argument there from the perspective, when you look at the, the top selling uh, crop protection products on the market, um, the direct contribution of marketed natural products may only be 15%. But if you take into account uh, the sets, the synthetic compounds that were either derived, modeled, or could have been modeled from natural products, this is more, uh, the influence is more 61% on the crop protection market. So uh, I think it, it's, it's a, a point well taken about the significant influence that natural product chemistry has had on the crop protection market. Um, so uh, I mentioned the advantage was you can also sometimes get the resistance gene along with the biosynthetic enzymes uh, for natural herbicide. So in this instance, um, uh, this is an interesting case in Ap on Aspergillus, um, and um, that Aspergillus produces uh, 
an herbicide that targets the same pathway as the ALS targeting herbicides, that is uh, branch side chain amino acid biosynthesis, except that it targets a different step in the pathway, the DHAT enzyme uh, dihydroxy acid dehydratase. Um, and uh, Aspergillus contains a, a biosynthetic gene cluster uh, comprised of AST A through AST D, and AST A, B, and C are biosynthetic enzymes that produce uh, aspartic acid, which is a potent inhibitor of DHAD. One gene is not a biosynthetic enzyme in that uh, cluster, which is AST D, and AST D actually encodes a uh, aspartic acid resistant enzyme which will counter the autotoxicity effects and the toxicity of aspartic acid. So uh, that aspergillus will not succumb to aspartic acid due to a susceptible DHAT enzyme because the uh, cluster also contains a, a resistance gene. So imagine um, this is an entire technology that's just sitting there in this uh, cluster. You could, uh, you could modify them for plants, um, these coding regions and also the ASD and move, move the whole package into uh, transgenic. And, and now you have a, a, a aspartic acid uh, resistant plant uh, using a novel mode of action herbicide. So um, really great potential in some of these um, uh, microbial biosynthetic gene clusters. So um, at the National uh, NPURU, uh, the discovery flow that they uh, typically use um, involves, um, of course, the vast repositories uh, at, at the center where the unit is located, the National Center for uh, National Products Research, which has uh, large collections of plant, of microbial, of marine, of various animal uh, extracts collected from all around the world. And um, these are used in their screening program. Um, and also a specific uh, tax are targeted if they have interesting characteristics that are worth investigating. Also interesting structures are, are examined. This is all pulled, uh, put into the uh, discovery flow involving uh, model species to examine the efficacy and phytotoxicity of these various compounds. Uh, and then when they, they look good at that stage, they're uh, subjected to uh, uh, our mode of action uh, screening process, uh, which first involves looking at the physiological and biochemical assays uh, to try and uh, nail down uh, what pathways are being um, impacted by the chemical. And then also genomics are used to uh, further refine an understanding of the pathways and genes involved. And uh, just to show you some of the interesting leads that they've come up with. Um, so uh, spliceostatin is a uh, uh, one of the interesting compounds um, that NPURU has identified, uh, and it's isolated from Burkholbia soil bacterium. It's an analog of, of spliceostatin A, which is an anti-cancer uh, anti agent, and it, it inhibits splicing. And if you're not familiar with that process, uh, just briefly, splicing is where the pre-messenger RNA, which contains a non-coding intron, is processed uh, to the mature messenger RNA that just has a continuous coding region. And so spliceostatins inhibit this process and uh, um, molecular characterization was performed by uh, Joanna Basha Herschel at NPURU. And she was able to demonstrate that spliceostatin C uh, is a strong inhibitor of both the constitutive and alternative splicing pathways in plants. Um, and uh, spliceostatin in the uh, phytotoxicity test showed that spliceostatin C is a very potent selective herbicide with a, a relatively low use rate, uh, 500 mg active ingredient per hectare. And I should point out that this work was performed through a cooperative research agreement with uh, a very innovative company in Davis, California, Marone Bioinnovations. And uh, we've had a long standing partnership with them and I have benefited greatly from this relationship. Another interesting lead is uh, from NPURU is the compound citral. So citral is actually derived from the key lime um, and it's a constituent of the oil um, that's made from key lime that's actually used for uh, organic, in organic farming for weed management. And uh, however, the 
citrol when purified from the soils is, is significantly more phytotoxic than, than um, using the complete oil or any other purified constituent in the oil. Um, and it's actually a mixture, a geometric uh, mixture of uh, the compound nerol and geraniol and uh, commercial formulations usually contain 60% geraniol and 40% nerol. Um, so uh, some motive action work was done on citrol at MPURU and just, uh, just to briefly show one of the interesting results, uh, this RNA-seq study showed um, 8% of downregulated genes were actually associated with nucleic acid binding. Um, and uh, this was followed up by uh, Ji Chung Pan uh, at NPURU, who sub subsequently determined that uh, citrol acts by inhibiting si single stranded DNA binding proteins, um, uh, such as the Whirly proteins, which are a small group of plant specific uh, single strand binding proteins that are required. Uh, for transcriptional uh, defense responses. Um, and then you can see uh, citrol in this uh, molecular modeling binding to uh, uh, Arabidopsis WHY protein. So um, that was a very nice mode of action uh, study outcome. And uh, another um, important lead that NPURU has come up with. Um, so there were two uh, furana chromomes uh, that were isolated from uh, the cella plant, Amis Viznaga, uh, Viznagan, and Kellen. And uh, this was done by taking a dichloromethane extract from uh, Kella and subjecting it to phytotoxicity guided fractionation. And the two furanochromones were identified, and they, they were not previously known to be herbicides. And uh, this work was conducted by uh, past and current NPURU scientists, Charles Cantrell, Kumadini Meet Gala, uh, Frank Diane, who's no longer with our unit, and Steve Duke, who retired recently. And this was done in collaboration with some investigators from the National University of Rosario in Argentina. And uh, both compounds were found to be phytotoxic to uh, lettuce and duckweed. Um, also, they were shown to inhibit the growth and germination of ryegrass, barnyard grass, crabgrass, foxtail millet, millet, and the dicots morning glory and velvet leaf. Um, this nagin was found to be more active in greenhouse trials and exhibited significant contact post emergence activity on velvet leaf and crabgrass. So, um, these uh, were obviously very important leads, and they have potential direct utility as herbicides or as lead molecules for uh, developing more active analogs. So a uh, patent was awarded in 2021 for this use. Now I want to uh, switch gears a little bit, um, talk about a different approach, which are bioherbicides. Um, and there's some very interesting work going on in this area in the Agricultural Research Service. So bioherbicides, uh, are essentially living entities that can act on weeds by producing inhibitors, uh, be they uh, phytotoxins or enzyme inhibitors, inhibiting cellular processes, or simply metabolic enzymes. Um, but uh, an important point is the mode of action and the identity of the specific compounds involved are for the most part not known. And, and uh, furthermore, um, these bioherbicides act in concert with the target uh, organism. So it's actually an interplay. So it, it involves chemistry from both the target as well as the bioherbicidal organism. So it's a, a complex relationship. We don't fully understand the chemistry. It certainly is an alternative chemistry, but it's uh, essentially a black box. And so we have to uh, focus on learning how to work with these organisms. And uh, some very interesting work being conducted uh, by uh, one of our chemists, uh, Bob Hoagland at the Crop Production Systems Research Unit in Stoneville, who's done a lot of nice work with uh, Douglas Boyette, who's a plant pathologist, uh, also in Stoneville at the Biological Control of Pest Research Unit. And uh, just to quickly summarize um, this really interesting work. Um, so they have one bi bioherbicidal fungus, uh, Myrocesium urocaria, that they tested against uh, the glyphosate resistant palmer amaranth um, which as you know uh, as mentioned is one of the 
worst weed problems facing American growers. Um, and you can see uh, here when treated with glyphosate, you can see the uh, the, the glyphosate resistant uh, Palmer amaranth is the bottom panel and wild type plants are the top panel. And you can see a very little effect of glyphosate on the resistant Palmer amaranth, a fairly significant effect of the bio herbicide. Um, but when you combine the two, you get this synergistic effect and, and you get uh, almost complete inhibition of the growth of the herbicide resistant biotype. And in fact, uh, uh, Bob and Doug um, identify this as a synergistic interaction. And so when you have a synergistic interaction, um, you get a much more powerful effect than uh, either uh, component by, by itself. And uh, so this is one novel and, and very promising uh, alternative way of, of controlling some of these uh, very difficult herbicide resistant biotypes. And uh, another point is when you identify a synergistic interaction, that means that you, that typically requires relatively low levels of both components. So that there's also a economic uh, advantage to working with these kind of synergies. And uh, so they're doing a lot of interesting things in this area that's impactful to the herbicide resistant weed problem. And uh, uh, you should check out some of their work. Okay, so uh, another area that um, the ARS is involved in, in uh, herbicide resistant weeds is plant incorporated pesticides. So uh, plant incorporated pesticides, the most well known example are the uh, BT toxin producing crops, which have had a uh, major impact on uh, insecticide use, reduce the amount of synthetic uh, insecticides required uh, by growers and also has had significant cost savings for growers who don't have to spend so much money on chemicals. Um, so we feel that uh, uh, plant incorporated herbicides could have the same impact on uh, agriculture. However, at present, there are no uh, plant incorporated herbicides on the market. And so we are working to um, address that um, shortcoming. Um, and uh, the fact is that nature has been in the business of plant incorporated herbicides for many eons because this is uh, one of the uh, one aspect, ecophysiological aspect of plants is that many plants do produce herbicides to take out their competitors. Um, and these chemicals are called uh, allelochemicals. And this is a major field of study, allelopathy. And it's thought of as sort of a chemical warfare that occurs between plants that are competing for uh, uh, limited resources, such as light and water and nutrients, and are able to take out their competitors by producing uh, phytotoxins that they release into the environment. And so some of the uh, uh, more extensively studied examples include the mummy lactones that are produced by rice plants, uh, the benzoxazinoid compounds that are produced in a number of grasses. Um, there's also gramine and hordenine produced by barley, uh, scopolectin from oat. And one of the most uh, extensively studied little chemicals is the compound produced by sorghum bicolor that I'll talk a little bit more uh, about, um, sorgolion. So sorgolion is a benzoquinone. Uh, it's an amphipathic molecule, as you can see, with this uh, polar head group and, and long hydrocarbon side chain. And uh, interestingly, it's uh, only found in the genus sorghum. And we actually did a survey a number of years ago where we took samples uh, throughout the grass family and only members of the genus sorghum, sorghum bicolor, shatter cane, Sudan grass, Johnson grass, you could find some level of sorgolion, but once you go outside of the genus uh, sorghum, um, you don't find a trace. And uh, sor uh, sorghum bicolor is a prolific uh, producer of this compound. The, the entire root system is, is coated with sorgolion. And in fact, if uh, you look at the exudate, uh, the root exudate from a sorghum plant, uh, uh, in some cases it can be up to 90% uh, weight to weight of the content of the exudate. And you can actually uh, dry it down and use it directly as an analytical standard in some cases, which is uh, very convenient. Um, and the reason why, um, one of the main reasons why it's it's targeted as for uh, 
plant incorporated pesticide development is because it's such an effective herbicide. It's a, a potent herbicide and it has efficacy against numerous uh, economically important weed species. Um, and it's also thought from uh, the research done in the Lelopathy community that it could be the, the major uh, factor that confers uh, allelopathic activity to the sorghum plant. In other words, its, it's uh, innate ability to fend off weeds could be largely attributable to uh, its production of this chemical. And uh, which it's also an interesting system or difficult system to work on because it's only produced in root hair cells. So you have to learn how to work with root hair cells. And uh, so we've been doing that. Um, and we had none of the genes, of course, so uh, we've been diligently working uh, in recent years to identify all the genes required for its biosynthesis from the um, ubiquitous uh, precursor palmitolio coa, which is essentially found in all plant cells. And if you add uh, five genes, you can produce sergolion. And so we've uh, been working to identify all these genes, and uh, we managed to uh, isolate all of them and uh, biochemically uh, characterize them and uh, fully elucidate the pathway. And so now uh, I, I just want to mention that it's been added to the uh, MetaSeq International uh, Biochemical Database as a new pathway. And I'm very happy uh, that our unit and, and the USDA was able to contribute to uh, fundamental knowledge of plant secondary metabolism in this manner. So uh, luckily, um, there was a group uh, a few years before we started um, that had uh, figured out a very clever, simple way to isolate root hair cells. Um, they were making protoplasts, and it was simply a manner of uh, matter of uh, putting the root systems in liquid nitrogen, then filtering them, and allowing the nitrogen to evaporate. And then you, uh, once uh, the nitrogen evaporates, ideally you have a very purified root hair preparation, which can then be directly used. Uh, for RNA isolation and making library sequence analysis. And then once we had the um, root hair transcriptome generated, then we added a secondary screen so that we could look for genes only expressed in root hair cells to generate uh, the, the candidates for our uh, enzyme work. And um, this approach turned out to be successful and I'll just quickly go through some of the highlights. So uh, Ji Chung Pan in our group worked on the desaturase and he was able to characterize uh, DES2 and DES3, which uh, convert uh, the ubiquitous uh, precursor I mentioned, palmitolio coa and, and they act on it uh, sequentially to produce a delta 9, 12, 15, 16, 3 coa, which is actually the entry molecule for Sergolian biosynthesis. Um, so that was very nice work. Uh, then uh, my lab was involved in characterizing uh, the methyl transferase. Uh, OMT3 only accepts uh, or vastly prefers alkyl resorcinolic substrates and can also act on the uh, physiological substrate uh, pentadecatrienyl resorcinol. And so that uh, methyl transferase participates in the Sergolian biosynthetic pathway. Um, and then uh, we also were involved in, uh, my lab was involved in working on a novel type of uh, type three PKS enzyme that had actually never been identified in any organism before, um, which unlike uh, enzymes like chalcone synthase, um, this PKS uses linear starters or acyl coas and then can, uh, through uh, iterative condensation reactions, build uh, the aromatic head group or uh, alkyl resorcinol product. And, and so these are actually referred to as alkyl resorcinol synthases. And so we identified two genes in sorghum that perform this reaction. And they only accept uh, linear so-called starter molecules and, and don't work at all with the uh, substrates typically used by other type three PKSs such as benzoyl-CoA, uh, et cetera. Okay, and then the last piece of the puzzle, um, this work was also done in Ji Chung Pan's lab, uh, the identification of CYP71 AM1, which performs the last steps in the pathway that uh, dihydroxylation of the uh, pentadecatrienyl 3-methyl ether to produce dihydrosergolion, which is actually um, 
this is actually the hydroquinone form of cigolian. It undergoes spontaneous auto-oxidation when secreted into the soil to uh, form the more biologically active, redox active benzoquinone. Um, so once this work was completed, we then had all of the genes required to go from palmitoleal CoA down to sergolion. So the tools were in hand to engineer plants to produce this compound. Um, and I just also want to mention that uh, the alkyl resorcinol synthases have also given us a means to actually manipulate sergolion levels in sorghum. So we've actually developed germplasm that uh, completely lacks sergolion through RNA interference by targeting uh, the alpha resorcinol synthases. And uh, we can also do, we did, here's an early uh, simple result using the enhanced 35S promoter, just overexpressing one of the uh, synthases. And in uh, event 84.1, we actually got a 60% increase in sorgolian. So this appears to be a potential control point in the pathway, and we can use it to manipulate uh, levels of sorgolian, which in and of themselves are potential products. And I also want to mention that um, there's a lot of interesting things that can be done with these mutants. And I'm, uh, if anybody's interested in using them to address uh, questions that aren't directly overlapping with our work, of course, um, I, I would be happy to share them or collaborate with you. So please feel free to contact me. And likewise, uh, we've had to generate some promoters which weren't available in the literature since Cervolion is expressed in root hair cells, we needed strong promoters to engineer, um, uh, do metabolic engineering work in, in other crops with these genes. Uh, so we isolated some uh, excellent, very specific, very powerful promoters that are active in both monocots and dicots. Um, and beyond our project, um, these, these promoters also have utility uh, for a lot of other areas, such as enhanced nutrient acquisition, uh, plant pathogen interactions, um, bioremediation. So if anyone has a use for these types of elements, please feel free to contact me and I can provide them. Okay, so obviously um, we want to produce crops that make sergolion. And so our uh, we're in the proof of concept phase uh, with just using the biosynthetic enzymes. And so we're wor working with the uh, Wisconsin uh, Crop Innovation Center to put in this uh, five gene vector into corn, soybean, and wheat. And we have also have some transgenic rice plants. Uh, we don't know how different species will respond to producing this toxin. So we're using a multi-species strategy. Um, and if we have success in this area, I uh, feel it'll be uh, very important advancement in the plant incorporated protectant field. So, but uh, we're not quite there yet because um, it's not enough to just produce the compound. You, you actually have to transport the compound to its site of action. And in the case of Sergolian, that's, that's out in the rhizosphere. So we still need the, the transport components that, that are required. But fortunately, um, Sergolian is a type of lipid. It's referred to as a phenolic lipid. And there's a lot known in, in the extracellular transport of lipid precursors in plants um, from uh, some uh, fairly well studied examples. So for example, um, the, the cuticle on the leaf surface, it's known, uh, it has a, a major uh, lipid component to it. And these lipid precursors are, are actually uh, transported outside um, uh, via uh, an ABC transporter that's then handed off to lipid transfer proteins, which then uh, help the, move it to its uh, final destination on the leaf surface. And likewise, um, during the development uh, superization of the root vascular steel, um, the endodermal cells produce uh, the uh, lipid rich uh, precursors for suberin, which are then moved out of the cells uh, through ABC transporter activity, handed off to lipid transfer proteins where they're then deposited in the Casparian strip. And another example is in the uh, developing pollen, uh, the exine coat, which is largely sporopollenin, which is a lipid rich compound. Uh, the precursors uh, for uh, the pollen cell wall development are produced in the tapetum or the tapetal cells, which uh, produce these uh, uh, lipoidal constituents that are moved out into the locule via ABC transporters and then 
um, assisted in moving to the final destination with the assistance of lipid transfer proteins. So uh, there's well studied uh, examples that we can model our own work on and propose that a similar process occurs in sorghum root hair cells where the sorghum is moved out of the cytoplasm with the assistance of uh, ABC transporters and then uh, move to the rhizosphere with the assistance of lipid transfer proteins. And so we're actively working on um, identifying the components in sorghum that um, carry out that activity. Um, and then I wanna bring up one more, I think really important point about these transporters is that um, if they, they are what are referred to as efflux pumps. And efflux pumps play a major role in nature uh, in autotoxicity avoidance. So um, a lot of this, uh, a lot of the research is, has gone on in microorganisms, but uh, higher organisms, eukaryotes, uh, conduct the same process using these efflux pumps. Um, and uh, there's three major types of efflux pumps that uh, you'll find in plants and other eukaryotes uh, that belong to the major facilitator superfamily, multi-drug and toxic compound extrusion or mate superfamily, and then the ABC type transporters. And all of these are involved um, in, in various systems in extruding toxic compounds from cells that create uh, sublethal conditions within the cytoplasm so that the organism does not succumb to the toxic effects of the compound that they're producing. And so that in a sense converts resistance to that organism to what the compound they're producing. So uh, we can then envision uh, the case of Sergolian. And I wanna point out, um, I think I mentioned that uh, sorghum plant is, is a prolific producer of this chemical. I mean, it is pumping it out. Uh, it's constitutive, so it's what's referred to as a phytoanticipin. It's not a phytoalexin that's released upon some stimulus. So it's not, it, it's produced in massive quantities continuously, so storing it would not be practical. Uh, uh, metabolically inactivating it, well, you'd still be faced with the problem of where do you keep it? So obviously what the plant needs to do is get rid of it, and that's uh, undoubtedly what it is doing. And so these efflux pumps and likely an ABC type transporter will play a critical role in autotoxicity avoidance. And moreover, uh, this will complete the technology so that uh, these pumps will also protect um, other crop hosts that we move the Sargolian biosynthetic pathway into. Um, we will also provide them with this pump, which will confer resistance to Sargolian. So that is the final piece of the technology puzzle. And uh, we're well along um, in this area. We have uh, transfer protein and transporter candidates used a genomics-based approach. Um, we found, uh, interestingly, there are clusters of, of lipid transfer proteins that are root hair specific on two different chromosomes in sorghum. Um, and add a little firepower to this project uh, uh, we've struck up collaborations with uh, Texas A&M, uh, Sakiko Okamoto, who's actually an expert in plant transport, and also have a, a new cooperative agreement that we're initiating with the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center, who have significant expertise in uh, cask CRISPR studies with sorghum, which is uh, not trivial, and we're very pleased to have that kind of uh, guidance. So um, I, I just want to take a second to mention, obviously, all this work on the Sargolian project required a lot of uh, people, and I've just been very fortunate to have so many uh, talented colleagues and collaborators on past projects and, and ongoing projects that, that made the uh, progress that we've had to date possible. And with that, um, that's all I had to say, and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. Thanks a lot for your attention. Yeah, thanks, Scott. That was great. Uh, we do have time for a few questions. So um, I'm going to just ask you, Scott, if you can address. Uh, I've got a question on the idea of resistance to, I guess, the natural based products as they are naturally occurring. And this idea of um, coevolution with, you know, the, the crop or the, um, you know, where they're being used. Is there any potential for 
you know, this, this idea of resistance to these novel mode of actions, whether where they're present in wild populations, is that a concern at all? Um, it is known. It's, it's not, uh, I mean, it's certainly, yes, uh, these, these uh, compounds arose in, in natural ecosystems. And so it has a specific ecophysiological role and there will be, and, and actually uh, chemicals like uh, allele chemicals play a major role in, in shaping um, ecological communities because of their toxicity. So yes, you get co-evolution, you get relationships uh, between species uh, overall, um, does that, does that uh, invalidate them as good candidates for natural product herbicides? Absolutely not. I mean, time and again, you find examples. And, and plus, we're not targeting, I, I mean, the weed species that, that are on, uh, you know, commercial growing operations are very different than, than the, uh, you know, the um, organisms that reside within their, their natural community structures. But certainly, um, yes, that, you know, co-evolution, various level, levels of tolerance and susceptibility in natural communities does exist. How much will it impact their efficacy in ag agricultural settings? I mean, to some extent, perhaps, but just from what I've seen and, and from the examples that we've worked with, um, they seem to work very well against the um, economically important weeds in many Great. cases. Yeah, a little bit different question here from this is in the just reading the chat uh, about uh, have you have any experience with uh, eugenol based herbicides any any experience with those. Um, now again i've been working on the Sergolian project so to ask me specifically the answer is no has, <laughs> has anyone in our unit. Um, geez. Uh, I, I would have to, you know, follow up on that. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, off the top of my yeah, head. No, that's fine. And I would again, uh, anyone in the audience, if you if you have specific questions like that, uh, feel free to ask Scott. Um, we have a question on the um, the Sergolian uh, fit into systems where again we're getting kind of specific here. So you know, just just uh, you take that into consideration where there's Striga asiatica. Uh, it's been shown to be a problem since it's. Um, uh, shown to stimulate its germination. So again, any any thoughts on that? And maybe the bigger question is, do you see this fitting into systems, you know, outside of of, of sorghum um, system? I mean, does this apply to the broader cropping systems in general? Um, well, I guess what what I was, if I'm understanding the question correctly, what what I was trying to uh, point out toward the end of my talk is we're trying to make this technology so that it has built-in resistance that it will confer to whatever host we put it into. And, and I, I thoroughly believe, and, and my transport colleagues are in agreement with me, that these transporters will be key to uh, making this technology viable. And, and, and whether or not that is the entirety of the mechanism that sorghum plant itself uses to avoid autotoxicity, by increasing the expression level of this transporter, we can make it super, you know, we, 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 can, we can use the, the right promoters and genetic elements to raise the level of expression of it much above what, you know, sor sorghum plant uh, normally expresses it at so that it will most certainly pump out, you know, anything trying to diffuse back into the host that's producing it. And, and so uh, it really feels strongly that um, we, we will have a, a pretty bulletproof uh, autotoxicity avoidance uh, mechanism built into this technology. Yeah, uh, I, I just want to uh, end with with kind of I want to. So you said you know you've been in this at this for thirty two years, and um, I'd like to know, you know, as you've been kind of exposed, are you seeing more of an acceleration of 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 this kind of um, approach and technology? Uh, more than you have, I guess, when you started out, and maybe there's an obvious yes to that, but I'd just like to hear your thoughts about, you know, when you first started and, and right now, are we seeing things really accelerate with, with how this, um, this research, you know, this direction is being, is going? I, I really feel, well, of course, when I started out, um, and, and given, as mentioned, that I've been doing this for 30 years, 
obviously when you go back 30 years and think about the techniques and the technology that was available to us at the time versus you know the explosive advancements in genomics and sequencing technology you know we now have the ability to do things that you know we couldn't even conceptualize 30 years ago and, and so and and add on another 20 years to that because molecular biology and genomics uh just the growth in in this field is is so dramatic um that that i uh I'm very excited about, especially some things that were brought up in some of the other talks, nucleic acid technology. I mean, I think technologies, yeah, and, it, and, and it'll become easier and easier with uh, genomics to come up with new pathways to do plant incorporated pesticides. Also the, the um, gene editing technologies, uh, there have been dramatic breakthroughs. So our ability to add these genes without actually doing genetic modification um, is improving. Um, so I, I actually, you know, we do need mode, new modes of action. Absolutely. I mean, that's critical, but I also think that genomics and nucleic acid technology, you know, I don't know, 30 years, I, I don't know exactly what the timeline is, but, uh, uh weed control, I think you'd be shocked at how we're going to be doing weed control 40 years from now, you know, with designer nucleic acids and, I mean, I, I really think uh, the technology that, that are going to be developed in the next few decades is going to be pretty astounding. Yeah, and I think you, you know, you touched on that with Dr. Mullen's work, you know, looking at how do we take some of these traits and actually put them in crops. So we're, you know, we're developing crops that are more resilient, more resistant to some of the, the things that weeds already, you know, are, are kind of um, can do already. So I think that's where this molecular genetic kind of um, uh, approach and, and techniques are really gonna help us advance um, and, and see a lot of that happening. So um, anyway, I just wanna say thank you. I know that there's some other questions here, but I'd encourage folks to contact either myself or, or um, Dr. Barrison to, to follow up. Really some exciting research here. And I would also say that we're actually looking to hire a, a, a weed um, ecologist looking at some of those uh, genetic, um, you know, issues uh, in the southeast. So just to push that a little bit for you, those of you who are um, looking for a, a position, ARS is actually hiring. So, um, you know, feel free to check that out. But anyway, thank you, Scott, for your time today. Appreciate you sharing uh, your research, really exciting stuff. Um, and I just want to say um, next week, we're going to hear again something different. We're going to hear about uh, the spread and distribution of invasive plants. So we're going to move to our final theme of impacts. So hopefully you all can join us. Um, we'll, like I've been saying every week, same time, same place, um, and we'll see you then. So thanks, everybody. We'll talk to you real soon. Thank you.